UK Biobank is the altruism of half a million people from across the UK. In 2006-2010, we recruited those half a million men and women aged 40 to 69 from England, Scotland and Wales. And then you follow them through their, their lifespan to find out what are the lifestyle, environmental, genetic and other determinants of disease. Why does one person get dementia and another doesn't? The most important aspect of UK Biobank it's making the data available to researchers to discover new ways to prevent and treat a whole host of diseases. The problem we had when the opportunity to sequence UK Biobank occurred was the scale of the data would be so large that our previous model of downloading the data that researchers wanted to their own systems really wasn't going to be feasible. So we needed to change the model such that researchers could come to the data and that's where the idea of having a research analysis platform sitting on the cloud, hosted in the UK, uh, would allow researchers uh, to come and work on that. The cloud deals with a, a problem of scalar data, but I think it does one other thing. It democratizes access because you don't have to have a big computer. You can take advantage of the fact that it's sitting on an enormous computer on the cloud. Uh, and when you need that enormous compute, it's available to you immediately. In addition to having a wide breadth of data on half a million in individuals and a long duration of follow-up, it's also the most easily accessible data resource in the entire world. So we have over 30,000 researchers actively using the resource. I'm an epidemiologist rather than a, an IT tech person, but. I'm told we have 30 petabytes. So I said, well, what does 30 petabytes of data mean? And they said, well, it's something like 45 million CDs. If you laid them side by side, that would get you from London to New York. And the data are increasing all the time. Because the data is um, multimodal, so by that I mean you have imaging data, genetics data, electronic healthcare records, you now see research that is really interdisciplinary. So it's not just geneticists using the genetic data to produce some research. You've got geneticists working with clinicians, working with bioinformaticians, working with epidemiologists to really answer those important questions. What we're now starting to do is think about how do we characterize the health outcomes to the same depth that we characterize the participants. And so we're looking at ways in which we can say take people who develop cancer and get hold of their histopathology data. And then there are groups that are going to apply machine learning and AI approaches to those histopathology data to pull out various kinds of measures from those uh, pathology slides that you can then subdivide cancers in various ways using the data. We talked to lots of research organizations around the world who were thinking of setting up um, a biobank type facility in their own population. And one thing I think that's really important to um, distinguish early on is whether it, populations want to set up a biobank, i.e. a biorepository of biological samples, or in fact, they want to, they want to set up a longitudinal population-based prospective study which is a very different thing, which is what UK Biobank is. So you're really in it for a 40, 50 year period. So you have to go into it with your eyes open and make sure that you have sufficient funding to sustain that project over the long term. And secondly, don't try and do everything all at once. Get the basics right. You can add on other data collection measures. And the third thing I would say is collect your biological samples Freezers are wonderful things. You store the samples and you can assay the genomics, proteins, metabolites, whatever it is you want, 10, 15, 20 years later. The reason for setting up resources like UK Biobank in different places is to complement them, not compete with them. The argument I think for setting up additional resources would be to do so in places where they're interestingly different. Uh, where the risk factor exposures are different. Because of course, in any one population, you only have a narrow range of the exposures that are seen across the world. We're just starting to think about 
how generative AI can really help researchers, firstly, by just simply finding out what's in the resource. But if you can use generative AI models and simply type in that question, it, it really facilitates researchers to think, actually, what research questions um, is UK Biobank powerful enough to address? And I think over the longer term, generative AI could also help in the actual analyses. So in terms of like prediction analyses. So for example, you know, given the cholesterol level of, a, of this subgroup uh, at baseline, what would you predict the cholesterol level to be in five years time or something like that? When UK Biobank was set up, the idea that one would be sequencing the whole cohort was pie in the sky. And, and yet we've sequenced them all. There is enormous value in just collecting biological samples and waiting and waiting until the technology catches up. You've got the sample, everybody gets sequenced. You've got the blood samples so you can look at the proteins in the plasma. And then when the technology is at the stage you can do it, you do all the proteins in the, the plasma uh, and so on and so forth. So storing these samples in these cohorts and just waiting until you can do it at scale is really uh, a key part of this.